I'm Rosie Sexton. I I was I'm the surgeon. Fighting out of Manchester, England, Rosie the Surgeon Sexton. I fought on Cage Warriors. I fought on Show XC, Bodog, Bellator, UFC. So most of the big promotions at one time or another. I'm now an osteopath. I run my own clinic here in Solihull. Here we are. I also have a maths degree from Cambridge, a PhD in computer science, and I'm now a local politician. So my last fight was in 2014 against Joanna. The Cage Warriors original Rosie Sexton versus the undefeated up and coming Joanna and Jacek. <laughs> I can say she's a force of nature. And still undefeated Joanna Yeldrachen. I think the thing that, that always struck me about Joanna, no pun intended, it was the combination of the power and the precision. That with some fighters, you know, there's a lot of power. A lot of it is you know, force over technique. But with Joanna, there's definitely the, the technique and the timing, which makes it particularly uh, uh, devastating. Now this is the shot that gave her the swelling. Oh my goodness, Joanna's touching that bubble. She does not even look the same. I mean, look at the size of that hematoma. So the impact there, I mean, obviously she's moving on to the punch, which is going to increase the force of that impact. And you can see that swelling immediately. I mean, a hematoma is basically just bleeding from uh, blood vessels under the skin. And that can range it from anything which is basically just a bruise through to um, those very large swellings. And with hematomas, a lot of it depends on where the hematoma is. So that's how dangerous it is will depend on the location. So if I take Oscar's glasses off, um, the hematoma we saw with Joanna was, was on the forehead and these frontal bones, they're pretty solid. It's uncommon to see a fracture around there, although not unknown as we'll see later on. Oh my God, look at her head, man. Look at her head, get some ice. And as soon as she gets back to the corner, the cutman has got the end swell. The idea with that is it's to reduce inflammation. So it's, it's the cold and it's di the direct pressure. You sometimes see bad end swell technique where people try to sort of smush the swelling around, almost like they're trying to push it away. And that generally just does more damage. So it's, the, it's that direct pressure that you want on the area, um, which helps to reduce that swelling. And I mean, the worst hematomas are the ones that you don't see. For example, if you've got a subdural hematoma, that's where you're looking at really potentially serious brain injury. So these hematomas, which are just under the skin, generally, I mean, certainly in this sort of location, they tend not to be dangerous in themselves, but they can look quite dramatic because there's a lot of swelling. I and mean, there's a large blood supply to the, the head and the scalp. It's gonna bleed quite profusely, but yes, I'd expect that to, to bruise up pretty severely afterwards. And it's all over! Travis Brown by TKO! And wow, look at the eye of Matt Mitrion. It's a, it's a good one to compare and contrast with the previous hematoma because it's a, again, it's a hematoma, but it's a very different hematoma. There's different considerations. And I think one of the things that we tend to see from fans is people will ask, well, why is one fight stopped and another one isn't? And it's like that, and I don't understand why this is considered dangerous, but that isn't. The, the thing with hematomas, just like with cuts actually, is it's location, location, location. It depends you know, where you get cut because that can signal very different things about what's going on under the surface. It's about whether that lump signals that there's something else that may become worse or may cause that fighter permanent damage if it's allowed to continue. Around the orbit, there are a lot of sensitive structures around there and orbital fractures are actually quite common. And what you sometimes see is a blowout fracture, which is where, if you look inside, that plate 
under the eye socket, which can be quite delicate. You can get a fracture there, and there's a lot of sensitive structures around there. So you've got the muscles that control the eyeball, you've got the nerve, infraorbital nerves. And when you see those hematomas around the eye socket, very often they do indicate that there's been a fracture. That's often why you'll see those stoppages, those blowout fractures. They can be really funny actually, because I've seen fighters with those, and they'll go to blow their nose, and the eye balloons out so they'll get a swelling under the eye, but you can feel it in your eyeball if you've got damage to that plate there. I mean, sometimes it'll just be a, a small little fracture that will heal by itself. Sometimes they need to go in and do surgery to, to reconstruct something. It varies a great deal from, from one to another, and you really can't tell until you get the fighter out of there and you do your imaging. And I mean, why some impacts cause that and others don't, it's, it's very hard to predict. Some fighters are known for marking up more easily than others. Hey, I'm not surprised, motherfuckers. Cool, huge elbow. And that's what cut him, and there's a huge kick. Yeah, so one of the things that fans often don't fully appreciate is that what doctors are looking for is not the amount of blood. I have seen one fight stopped because of the volume of blood, and that was because the fighters were starting to slip on the blood, and that was a Cage Warriors fight. He can, can he get Houston back up? not able to get back to his feet. Oh, this is not oh, good stop, for Ross Houston. Stop, 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 stop. Fight's over. Now, the reason that cuts cause concern is one, if they're going to affect the fighter's vision, so if the blood's getting in the fight line, they can't see. But the other thing is, if the cut is deep enough, if that fight continues, that fighter may suffer a, a permanent injury. What's Nate doing with his head? The way he's shaking his head off. Oh, the the doctor's head. waving it off. No way. Oh. What? As a fighter, you'll often sort of see stars, which is, is basically where your, your visual cortex bounces off the back of your skull. Or, you know, even sort of have a brief sort of loss of consciousness. You'll often get those moments where you're not quite sure where you are. It's, it's quite common to see fighters sort of shaking their head and trying to clear their head. So again, a lot of the time you see fans being very puzzled by why a particular decision was made. You know, I'm not gonna say that anyone's perfect, but when you're close up there, you get a very different picture. I'm inclined to think that the, the referee and the doctor, they're the ones that in the best position to make that call. Nobody cares about blood. The fighters are all tested for blood-borne viruses beforehand, so the fact there's blood, like I said, nobody's bothered about that. I mean, whereas you might say in, in other sports where they don't have that blood testing beforehand, there's a concern about the fact that there's blood. So if the cut's not somewhere that's dangerous or threatening, it doesn't matter. What do you think about Fedor's brother, Alexander, fighting with hepatitis B? Bonkers, absolute bonkers. They sh that shouldn't be happening. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I think gets the sport a really bad reputation. I mean, hepatitis B, you can vaccinate against, but I mean, the thing is, you don't know where that blood's going to end up. You, I've, I've spoken to, you know, commentators and judges who've been sprayed with blood just because they're sitting next to the cage when something explodes. I mean, unless you're going to ensure that everyone in proximity to that is, is vaccinated, I don't see how you can do that. I mean, you, you, you can't. It's against every health and safety, you know, regulation. That's, that's not something that any reputable athletic commission or governing body would condone. Good right hand by I, and that caused the cut on the ear of Leslie Smith. Yeah, that's it. They're gonna call it. She might lose her ear. So, yeah, that, that looks pretty gruesome. The thing with ears is that if you look at a skeleton, there aren't any. I mean, you have, you have a hole there, and that's it. So, ears are made of cartilage and covered in skin. They're not attached to the skeleton by bone at all. I mean, I'm not recommending you do, but you can pull an ear off. So, if there's damage to that cartilage, it can make it quite vulnerable. I suspect that there was, there was damage to that ear beforehand. And when you get a cauliflower ear, what people talk about as a cauliflower ear is where there's been a blood clot, so a hematoma, that forms under the perichondrium, so the, the lining of that cartilage. And what that does is it stops the cartilage from getting nutrients because it normally it gets its nutrients from, the, from that lining. And when it can't do that, that cartilage actually dies. So it's cartilage is normally living tissue. And that's when you get that thickened effect on that ear. 
Now, you can prevent that when, when it balloons up. If you drain it, that's less likely to happen. So, I mean, you can see that my ears are a little bit mangled. I did drain mine, but you've then got to pack it with cotton wool and you've got to compress it. And when you're training for a fight, that's not always practical. So I think there were a few fights when I was, I was draining my cauliflower ear, putting ear guards on, going and training, um, and then coming back and having to do it all over again because I'd knocked it. And it can be really hard to, to sort of really take care of them properly. What you'll see is a lot of fighters just don't bother. Um, so they, that's when you end up with sort of these huge, big cauliflower ears. That this is, it's very conceivable that a hard shot there could rip her entire ear off. If you look at the skeleton, there's nothing there. You know, what's keeping that ear on? It's soft tissue. Again, it's one of those stomach turning injuries. This is uh, the main event of the evening. It's time! Anderson, the spider! Familiar yellow trunks, blue trunks for Weidman. The question is, how long is Chris going to stand with him before he decides to try to take him down? Yeah. Oh, nice. He checked oh, it. No. He hurt himself. He hurt his leg. And it's all over. Oh, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That's, again, one of those really classic stomach-turning injuries. There are a few things that happened here. When you hit here, that's a very dense piece of bone, and you're hitting sort of lower down on the shin where you've got a, a weaker bit of the shin bone. The angle that he hit it at is the, the leg was coming up, so it was almost in line with the, the femur, and there's not much give. There's nowhere really for that force to be dissipated. I mean, the thing with shin bones is that bones adapt to the force you put on them. So if you're used to kicking things, what you get is microtrauma developing in that bone, which then grows back stronger. And that's how bones strengthen. However, if you're getting a lot of microtrauma without the opportunity for that recovery period, perhaps in between training sessions, or you know, you've had a hard fight camp, perhaps there's been a big weight cut, there could have been sort of a silent stress fracture underlying that. Again, don't know whether that's the case, here. But that might be the ending of Anderson Silva's career. That is an incredibly difficult injury to come back from. In terms of the recovery, I think there are a number of aspects to it. There's One is putting everything back in place. So again, generally with an injury like this, you're going to end up with it being plated with screws just to get the bone back where it should be. Um, and again, that can go well or it can go badly. Some people have, you know, the surgery goes really well and it works really well for them. Other times you end up with having sort of persistent problems afterwards, you know, needing to go back in and take the metal wear out or they just never quite get that recovery. From there, you then have to have the soft tissue recovery afterwards. So the recovery from the surgery, one from the damage done by the surgery and also from sort of the deconditioning, the wasting and any damage that happened during that initial injury. You're gonna to have to have that period of rehab to get that function back, to get the muscles back to full strength and also to get some of that mobility back because some of that mobility that you lose is going to be permanent, depending on how the surgery's gone, you know, what's been plated and where. And that's generally where somebody like me will come in. I'll often help with the rehab period. You know, here's what's not working very well, where we've got muscle weakness, where we've got maybe stiffness, some of the joints where some of the, you know, we've had a loss of movement. Sometimes it's a case of saying, right, actually, you're not going to get that movement back. So how can we compensate for that elsewhere? You know, how can we either improve strength or improve mobility? elsewhere in order to enable your body to, to cope with that. Maybe it's a case of sort of changing techniques, changing movements, changing how you do things. So again, that can also be part of that rehab process. That's where things get more difficult and more involved. When, I mean, MMA has been your life, it's got you to where you are, it's made you a superstar. It's much easier to look at that, I think, and say, well, that's the nature of the game. That's, that's the risks we take. When you look at the pay scales, you know, some of the guys sort of lower down on the roster are really not making very much money. I've spoken to some fighters who are barely covering their expenses. And by the time you paid, you know, for your manager and for your training camp and for all of the, the things you need, a lot of them are looking at it as an investment. It's not that I'm making money now, it's that I hope that in the future I'm gonna make more. I mean, I've often called it the, the, the worst lottery ticket in the world. 
got our black girl jujitsu tonight also. Uh, I'm Tim Sons. Uh, so I remember watching this fight at the time. Take a good look at Tim Sylvia's arm right here. Watch this. Pop! What's oh. that? Yeah. What is that? Uh, yeah, so here. This is an ugly armbar. I mean, obviously, in a fight, things get messy, so you wouldn't necessarily expect it to be textbook perfect. But in this case, this is very much a, a brute force over technique move. You can see that the, the arm is starting to turn out. In a perfect world, you want to have the thumb pointing away from the direction that you're putting the arm bar on because that locks the arm out. It's that bone on bone contact. So in this case, you're already starting to get that pressure going onto the inside of the elbow, which is sometimes people start to be able to spin out of it. So that's the first thing. Then the next thing is you can see Sylvia pulling his arm out and at the point the break happens, the elbow is actually out. So the, the elbow is out of the lock. So the fulcrum is now here. Mir goes to crank it anyway, and that's why the arm just splits in the middle. So the amount of force that's going through that is incredible. You wouldn't typically expect that break from that technique. You know, normally you'd see damage around the elbow joint itself or damage to the ligaments. For most fighters, you know, that happened in, in the bantamweight class, for example, you wouldn't expect to see that. You know, when the bone becomes the limiting factor in some of these cases, these, these guys are absolute monsters. So as is often the case with these sorts of injuries, Sylvia needed surgery afterwards to, to plate the arm and to, you know, put some screws in to, to realign everything. Now, with those kinds of surgeries, sometimes the metalware stays in and it causes no problems and it's absolutely fine. Sometimes they need to go in and take it out. Like I say, in this case, what's unusual is that it's years later that it started to cause problems. And obviously they then needed to go in and take those screws out and things have become infected and that's caused a whole lot of other problems further down the line. Obviously, you know, that's a, a risk you take with any kind of surgery. You know, anytime you open the body up or, you know, put foreign objects in it, there is a risk of, of infection there. Frank rolls and rolls him over again. Now Frank gets the right leg over the face. Oh, and that was yeah, critical. It's broken right yeah. there, absolutely broken. So once again, the interesting thing with this one is that that's not necessarily the injury that you would expect from this technique. Normally, with a Kimura, it'll, it, it'll typically go on the, on the muscles around the shoulder joint itself. So you'd expect, you know, maybe a torn rotator cuff, a dislocated shoulder, something like that. Now you can see that that arm's bending at, you know, quite some angle. And I think the only, you know, explanation here is that the muscles around that shoulder, I mean, he's so flexible and so strong that the the point of least resistance, if you like, the, the, the weak link, is actually that bone. You know, there's an, an immense amount of force going through that in order for, for that to happen. Again, when you've got these, these huge guys and so much power, both that combination of flexibility and strength at the shoulder there, for the bone to break as the, as the weakest element, you know, that, that just, it, I mean, the reason that we're, we're looking at that is because it's unusual. You know, that's not what we would normally expect to happen. Introducing Evangelista, Cyborg Dos Santos, MVP, Michael Benhur Page. Beautiful liver shot, that hurt him. Santos is hurt. He is really hurt. Cyborg runs into the jockey and it's over. As we said earlier, you know, those frontal bones, they're really quite solid. That's not necessarily what you'd expect from you know if, from that impact for, for that to fracture I mean I've, I've no idea what kind of force that would take I've seen comparisons where people have said it, it's like being in a, a car accident there's a question of you know it has there been any damage to the underlying structures and in this case we're talking about the brain and I mean brains are, are weird when it comes to damage because sometimes you can have things that look like they ought to do a lot of damage but it doesn't really seem to have much effect on somebody. And then you can have a very small thing, which actually can cause a huge, you know, this is why the brain surgeons get paid the big bucks. I mean, I would expect that to be a career ender. It is really one of those that makes you sit up and, and think this can be a pretty scary sport. I mean, that said, you know, you look at other sports like rugby and things like that, and you see some pretty scary injuries as well. I think people draw a distinction because in MMA, it, it's the intent is to cause damage. 
whereas that's not the case in some other sports. From my perspective as, as a clinician, I tend not to look at what the intent is, but what the effect is. The, the injuries that you tend to get on a statistical level across the sport, that's what you're looking at. You know, that's, that's the danger of the sport. It's not about whether somebody's trying to do it or not. That doesn't really matter. Rosie Sexton, the aggressive lady from the UK, takes on a former karate champion of the 90s in Wendy Tomomi from Japan. Oh wow, I haven't seen this for ages. From the bright, sunshiny shores here in Costa Rica. The, the Costa Rica fight, it's spending two weeks in a holiday resort while you're training for a fight, um, which is an interesting experience. Fighting on a beach was really weird. I don't know whose idea it was. It definitely wasn't the fighters because doing that in 40 degree heat was just nobody's idea of a good time. The mat got really hot and people were actually getting burns on their feet from it. All right, Rosie Sexton is standing by and there's Rosie. Uh, yeah, this is quite surreal watching this back because I haven't seen this in years. It's funny, I'm getting that sort of, those sort of butterflies. <laughs> Pre-fight feeling. Touch gloves, go back to your corner, get ready to fight again. I knew that she was a good striker, I knew she had good footwork. This was quite early on in my career, relatively speaking. I wasn't doing a good job here of setting up the clinch and the takedowns. Managed to get it to the floor, here I'm much more comfortable. I mean, this is obviously where I wanted it to be. I, I was pretty confident on the ground that anywhere on the ground, I knew, I, I knew my grappling was better than hers. I should have finished it in that first round. I should have finished that first round. So it's so frustrating watching this back now because there's so many things that I would want to do differently. And I think it's that frustration that actually led to what happened there. And Rosie does take it to the ground. Oh, Look at this! He gets a great position. He's He's oh my over. God! Look at this! Look at this, guys! Her leg is completely dislocated and broken. Oh, that was an ugly takedown. I still kick myself about that. That was bad technique, hundred percent. So here's where I'm, I'm about to go for that takedown, and the weight's just going in completely the wrong direction here. I threw my weight back anyway, and. It's very much sort of brute forcing it. And you can see that the weight's just gonna go through that ankle. And the ankle sticks to the mat. Again, that's what, I mean, at this point, I, cu I couldn't see what's going on. I'd felt a huge snap. So I knew that something wasn't right. And I was really just waiting there for, for the referee to, to step in. And I think it's a fracture of tibia and fibula, fibula, which ended up then having to be plated. I think there might have been some complications after that as well. I, I don't know the details. Um, I, I deliberately didn't look into, into that too closely. I did blame myself for that injury. I think, rightly, I think, because it was a bad takedown. Her weight was going forwards and I sort of brute forced it. And you know, had I set the takedown up better, that wouldn't have happened. I wrestled myself over this for a while because the risk of that sort of thing happening is what we sign up for. We know that going into a fight. At the same time, that sort of injury is not what any fighter wants to see. You know, what I'd always aimed to do was uh, to dominate technically, to control the fight, and any damage is incidental to achieving that objective. Whereas in that case, it was very much something that didn't need to happen and it shouldn't have happened. I mean, I went away after that and I spent a lot of time thinking about what had happened, about why it had happened. I mean, both from a technical point of view and also I think from a, you know, how do I feel about the fight game generally and you know, what I'm doing here and why I'm doing it and, and all of those things. I think it brings up a lot of those questions when you, when you see those, those more serious injuries. I really felt that for a, a long time afterwards. I mean, it, it was a weird setup because with Bodog Fight, they were pre-recording the episodes and releasing them individually over a period of time. So there was that whole confidentiality agreement. You couldn't talk about what had happened. So I spent several weeks not being able to tell anyone what had happened and not talking about it. I didn't celebrate that win. That was when, you know, at the time, it felt like it was a win on paper, but it didn't feel like one. As I said, that wasn't how I wanted to win that fight. With me this morning, one of the UK's leading female champions. This is Dr Rosie Sexton. She's a mum. She has a first-class degree from Cambridge. And we should say right up, Rosie, that cage fighting, people that do it aren't that keen on that term, are they? No, uh, we call it mixed martial arts. I think 
One of the great things about being involved in women's mixed martial arts when I was is I managed to, to see it through from really the, the very dawn of women's mixed martial arts when it first started to become a thing, right the way through to when women first fought in the UFC. And I think seeing it develop over that period of time and being part of that was, was an amazing experience. I mean, I remember a time when Dana White very clearly said, women will never fight in the UFC. When are we gonna see women in the uh, UFC, man? Never. Never? Never. <laughs> Going from that to the point where I'm getting phone calls saying, do you want to fight in the UFC? Sometimes it, it, when you're in there, you know, you, we can be impatient for that speed of change, you know, you look at things and you think, oh, it's it's not it's not where we're not where we should be, you know, we should be doing this, we should be doing that. But when you look back and see how fast things actually did change in reality, um, it's like night and day. In terms of where women are in the sport of mixed martial arts, compared to most other professional sports, I think actually women are light years ahead of where they are in other sports. You know, women fight on the same cards under the same terms as men with the same rules and that's something that we fought really hard for you know all the women of my generation seeing that now and seeing the opportunities for the young female fighters coming through is absolutely amazing and it's i'm, I'm proud to have been a part of that and to have played a part in that and that's an experience that i will always take with me that's it was, it was an amazing thing to be part of